Right, I think we're live now. Uh, evening, everyone joining in from wherever you are around the world. Uh, another live tasting for you on, uh, I think we're on Facebook and YouTube uh, tonight anyway. So uh, we're going to do, I think most of you, some of you may be familiar, some of you not with, with the setup, but we, we've sent out tasting packs to, I think there was maybe 150 or so people with tasting packs uh, that we sold on our website. So hopefully many of you are joining us, but if not, you know, feel free to join in and ask any questions. We'll do our best to keep up with the questions that come in. So feel free to ask away and uh, uh, grab any Kilhoman you've got in your cupboard or any anything else and, and join in. Uh, me and George, uh, my brother, uh, will be taking you through. The resemblance might, might be clear, might not be. Uh, I've got a sort of slightly homeless, homeless beard look. <laughs> Uh, James, uh, George can't grow a beard, so uh, he's... No. he's <laughs> no, but I'm glad... Well, at least I've got hair on my head, not like you, sort of losing... Uh, it's only, only getting one side. We've got those. Yeah, that's good. Um, but uh, so we'll be, um, we'll be chatting you through the whiskies. And George and I have been at Kilhoven for uh, for quite a while. We It was our, our father, uh, Anthony, who set up Kilhoven back in 2005. And me, George, and we've got another brother as well who's... In the middle of us, I'm youngest. George is the oldest, and somewhere in the middle is is James. And we've basically been running the sort of sales, marketing, everything else side of it. You know, at the, at the beginning when we first started producing whiskey, we were bottling and cafe and washer upper and and all sorts. But uh, since then, we've been moving into different parts of production. We we helped out with uh, some of the malting, some of the warehousing, even some of the distilling when we were trusted enough but but basically bit parts of everything as we went through but for the last i don't know george what is it seven eight years it's really been more on the sales and marketing yeah. side and traveling around the world and maybe we've met some of you before i don't know and uh, in various parts of the world doing tastings and mask classes and basically trying to convince as many of you as possible to drink kilhoman and instead of all the other whiskies out there uh, we may have been successful we may not have been i see some people in from america whether it's uh, arizona missouri uh james usually does america so i don't really know where those places are in america but i'm sure they're lovely <laughs> uh we'll be uh we'll be going through the whiskies anyway that we've got in the pack there was maki bay san egg uh, lot gorm which is a, a whiskey not to be released yet coming up and and comrade which is a, a release we'll we'll tell you about um which is a, something a bit special so these ones in the pack if not feel free to have everything else uh to quickly Tell you a bit about Kilhoman, though. For those who aren't familiar, I'm sure some of you have heard me talk about Kilhoman, probably uh, bore you to death about it. But for those who are new to Kilhoman, uh, we're, we are a small sort of family run distillery, as you may have already guessed. Uh, my dad and also my mum still work at Kilhoman since they, they built the distillery uh, 15, almost 16 years ago now. And we are something slightly different to Isla. So we're built on the island on the west coast of Scotland, which is obviously famous for that sort of peaty smoky style of whiskey and there are very famous neighbors of ours as you may have noticed whether it's the the big earthy peat monsters from Ardbeg, Lafroy, Glagavulland down the south of the island or some of the lighter expressions maybe from you know Beaumont or or Bunnaharbon who tend to be a little lighter peated so there's there's various I think uh, you know uh, other distilleries on the island nine distilleries now on the island if you include Ardnaho who started recently so it's a, a famous whiskey producing island and we're delighted to be to be part of it and uh, the way we're slightly different I guess from the others is not only being new and uh, and the size we are being being fairly small and family run but we're also a farm distillery so we grow some of our barley on the farm uh, we grow around about 250 tons of barley at the moment we grow on the farm then we take that through malting on a traditional floor malting through peating distillation, maturation, bottling. So every stage of production can be seen at Kilhoman, from the barley field all the way through to the bottle, that production can be seen. It's not with our full production, so it's not with everything we, we produce. Uh, we don't grow enough on the farm to be able to produce everything we, we do into bottles. So we have two different styles of Kilhoman, really. One that's 100% island, which is what we call it, which is barley to bottle, never leaves the farm, or it's uh, commercial malt from Portella Malting, so on Isla. There is a, a malting zone by Diageo who uh, we buy barley from and take that through. So there's sort of two different styles of Kilhoman, uh, really. But um, we're really proud. And, and my dad's ambition always was to 
take whiskey production really back to its traditional roots on Isla. You know, you go back to Isla, you know, 100 years ago and, and there had been farm distilleries all over the island, you know, all producing small, smaller amounts of whiskey, uh, you know, uh, going back even further, 200 years plus, you know, there would have been small crofters growing barley where they would, you know, virtually make uh, whiskey in their garden shed, that sort of style of whiskey or illicit distilling that went on on Isla. Um, and it's that real style of whiskey that Kilhoman and my dad wanted to recreate by having it on a small scale, doing it by hand. So it's the barley shoveled by hand and raked by hand. It's not you know, machinery throughout, you know, on Isla even, you know, I think we have the, the second most employees on the island in terms of at the distillery because we have all these different stages of production uh, on the, at Kilhoman. So it's uh, something a bit just different if you ever do come and visit us, uh, which hopefully you do. Um but before I, I bore you to death too much without actually tasting the whiskey, we'll probably get into that. And, and as we go through talking about the whiskey, we'll, we'll touch on the different parts of the process, how we make it differently, what we do differently to others. Uh, and as I said, if you've got any questions, feel free to comment and, and hopefully we'll pick them up. But um, George isn't going to sit there silent for the whole tasting. I'll, I'll let him speak well, a little bit. So I think he's going to take you through the first I can whiskey. Say, I, can, I can finish off if you want. I mean, you, you, like to, you like the sound of your own voice occasionally, Pete. Um, well, I was going to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the first whiskey that we're going to taste this evening is our Maca Bay. Um, those of you familiar with Kilhoman are probably familiar with this um, expression. It is our is our core product. Um, that's the usual bottle that it comes in. Um, so Peter mentioned there that we, we grow a percentage of the barley on the farm. Um, the whiskies we're actually tasting this evening, this is um, from barley that we buy in from Portela Maltings, uh, owned by Diageo. Um, we buy that in at a higher PPM uh, in the region of 50 parts per million. Uh, so to give you an idea on the on the phenol chart, as it were, uh, we're up there with the likes of our Beg and, and Lefroy. So very, very heavily peated barley. Uh, but what we do at Kilhoman is during the distillation process, we distill in, in very small stills. Uh, we have a longer fermentation time. And what we're looking to do there is create a lighter, sort of citrusy, more fresh style of spirit. Um, when the distillery was set up in 2005, one of the main things that our father was looking to do was to produce that style of spirit, heavily peated barley, but have a slightly lighter style of spirit. Um, and try and release it at a, at a relatively young age. Uh, we didn't do any gin, we didn't do anything. So focusing solely on whiskey production um, and concentrating on the spirit quality and also the wood that we, we filled into meant that we've been releasing whiskey since 2009. Um, so 2009 to 2011, we had various different uh, small batch releases, spring, summer, winter. Um, that were combination of bourbon and sherry cast matured. And then in 2012, uh, we were in a position where we'd built up enough stock in the warehouse to be able to, to give a, a Kilhoman that was always available, whether you're in the UK or China, America, New Zealand, Australia, wherever you are in the world, you can always get hold of Kilhoman. And that is when in 2012, we released our Maca Bay. And Maca Bay um, is a beautiful beach just to the west of the distillery, probably half a mile, quarter of a mile from the distillery. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and that is what we named our core expression under, uh, um, after, sorry. Um, it is predominantly bourbon cast matured. So it's 90% bourbon cast, 10% Oloroso sherry cast. Um, and on the nose, you will get the peat coming off, but there's also a lovely, fresh, citrus, almost grassy note that comes out very very little sherry influence on the nose um and on the palate for me it's got that lovely combination of the the uh the peat smoke and the and the, the peat on the palate as well as the the freshness that comes through from our our spirit quality and the maca bay it's it's evolved slightly over the years, um, but the, the recipe itself and the, the age, average age of the casks hasn't really changed the last, I would say, four years, maybe. Um, so it sits around the four or five year old mark. It is relatively young. Um, we don't have a huge amount of older stock of whiskey, purely because of in the early days, we were only producing a small amount of whiskey 
um, 70,000 litres. And then after 2009 was where we really increased production through increasing um, batting tanks, etc., to push us over 100,000 litres. So Maccabay, is a, as a relatively young whisky, has got a huge depth of character to it. And the influence of the, the small amount of sherry cask, 10%, really does give it a little bit more horizontal flavour profile, a little bit more oil on the inside of the cheeks. Um, and at 46%, and like everything that we, we produce at Kilhoman, natural colour, non-chill filtered, um, and it is a, it's, for me, it's a great re representation of the style of whiskey we produce, as well as being a, a great representation of an island yeah. style. Um, yeah, I think you're you touching it there. With, sorry, on you go, on you go, George. It's, it's, what we also love about it is the fact it shows Peter as a, as a flavour, rather than sometimes Peter be, people can be slightly put off by heavily peated whiskies because they feel the peat overpowers the palate, whereas for us there you've got that lovely combination of the freshness coming through as well sorry peter i well i get accused of interrupting you a lot I, I, you were on a roll i didn't want to didn't want to stop. stop you too much of your tracks but um no i think uh as you said it, it's it's sort of what our dad wanted to create really when he built Kilhome and it's an isle of whiskey yes you know i think there'd be a lot of isle of whiskey fans disappointed if when Kilhome was built we were the first new distillery for 124 years if we did a soft unpeated whiskey i think people would probably be pretty disappointed so uh, we want to produce something peaty so that's this mafia bay but, but it's smoky but then it's fruity fresh and it's got that sweetness so it's a real good balance of a lot of different flavors it's not just smoke that blows you away it's not really sweet it's just got a really good balance of that salty sort of smoke to it fresh um uh, fresh fruit and then a little bit of sweetness as well so it's it's um yeah really good dram and sort of what we're aiming for as, as a typical kilhoman I also forgot to mention that um, we're now we paired up with. I'm not sure if, if some of you remember we we did a uh, tasting before Christmas, which was uh, chocolate with our with our whiskies. We've now paired up with Coco in Edinburgh, who now produced a uh, the Kilhome and the the sea salt and lime. You're chocolate. holding up the wrong the wrong chocolate, aren't you? No, I'm not. No, no, it's not. <laughs> no I'm not holding up the wrong one. Um, which pairs uh, yeah. with the um, the Maca Bay. Um, those of you who haven't bought it on our website, it is available through our website. And the combination of in the chocolate of the the salt and the lime really does balance nicely. Um, and as you might have tell can tell, I, I've eaten quite a lot of my chocolate that arrived only a couple of days ago. Yeah, I'm supposed to save that for tonight. But, um, well, but yeah, no, it's great. I recommend trying the whiskey first, obviously, to get mm. the full flavour of the whiskey. But then afterwards, if you want to try it with the the chocolate it's really just as george said that sort of saltiness the lime sort of fruit really pairs with the citrus notes in the whiskey and that salty smoke it's it's a it's a really great combination and, and whiskey is great with food not just wine i think i i saw earlier there was a question on the tequila cask um to cover that one quickly the tequila cask we did mention we the rules change in the scotch whiskey industry which are usually managed pretty tightly uh where we've got a set amount of casks that we can mature in whether it's wine casks or uh, ex bourbon, ex sherry, whatever it might be, we've now been allowed to mature an ex tequila and mezcal cast uh, for the first time in um, ever. So we started finishing some of our whiskey in uh, tequila and mezcal, and I think we've we've got our first releases coming up, George, in the UK. Aren't we doing a bottling soon with the the, the mezcal, I believe, or tequila? No, no, not as far as I'm aware. But anyway, um, that was the plan. So that was the plan, but they were doing something slightly different. Man. We're doing something slightly different. Another question here that we've got is about the stills um, and whether the stills were, uh, we had small stills because of the, the style of spirit we wanted to produce or was it scale? Um, I mean, personally, I would say it was, it was a combination of the two, mainly the scale of the size of the distillery that our father was looking to produce. Um, I, the original plan was to be even smaller than we, we originally were in 2005. Um, but also with the smaller stills and anyone who's been to Kilhoman will see that our, our stills are, are small, but also relatively tall for the, si for the size of them. So what you get there is more copper contact, which also aids in the lighter style of spirit. But in the early days, it was, it was due, due to the, um, the scale of the distillery and the production size. Uh, we've now actually got a new still house. So we've got two still houses at Kilhoman now, um, identical as far as, um, stills mash tun etc 
Um, and one now is is exclusively for our our own barley that we we produce in there. So it's um, that gives us a huge amount of flexibility, and also it gives us the chance to be able to experiment with barley varieties and yeast varieties a lot more, which is something our fathers turned into a bit of a geek over as well. Yeah, I think he actually wanted to to buy secondhand stills for the plant because it costs so much for new stills, and we overspent so much on actually building the distillery looked for secondhand stills to but there was nothing of the size he wanted so new was the only option and we had to go back to the bank and borrow a bit more money and uh, and, and design them ourselves but i think as george said uh looking back it was a real blessing in disguise that we didn't buy some old stills and make a spirit that suited them it was all about the new design with my dad and dr jim swan who was a, a big influence on to home and designing exactly the shape and size and everything of the stills so um to produce this exact style of whiskey um so yeah that's our the macabre and um you know it is uh for me it's a it's a it's a brilliant dram and it's a brilliant starting point for where we're going to go this evening as far as through the range um and you know we are trying to keep up with the questions um if you see me looking at my phone or peter looking at his phone it's because people are also texting the questions into us yeah um so just ask the lot gorman in germany uh so it's not available yet, the 2021 version, if, if you're looking for that one. Um, that's not available in any market yet. We we're actually releasing that at the end of March. Uh, but if you're looking for Lot Gorn previous editions, it, it's widely distributed across Germany. I think Germany is lucky enough to get the biggest allocation of any market, actually. So our, our distributor there is Hansi Attish. Um, so if you if you comment uh, in here, we'll we'll get back to you on on where you uh, might be able to get that or their contact details, so you can locate that in uh, in Germany. Um, and I think there was a question on cut points as well. And and actually, this is something we do a bit differently. Maybe we don't actually change the cut points. We found the cut points since I think day one. I think it was George when um, I don't think we changed it since there, where we go from after five minutes of four shots. It's a slightly technical question, but when the stills are running and producing spirit. Uh, we basically take from around about 76% alcohol down to 65.5% alcohol, which is at the very top end of the run. Uh, whereas when you get lower than alcohol strength, you get some harshness or off notes in the whiskey, and we don't want any of that. So we keep it fairly high. And then actually we do our experimentation more so with the barley types, uh, the peating levels, uh, the yeast we use for fermentation. We've done a bit of experimenting. And then, of course, the casts we use. So actually in the stills and cut points, we keep fairly rigid to really keep the the quality of the spirit high and the subtle experimenting is done with the other other elements of production uh just also before we move on to the next round there's a couple of questions that um i'm going to be going just any plans for heavily peated at the moment there's no real plans to go for the heavily peated side um with our own kiln and malt floor uh we have done a few uh unpeated casks uh, but it's something that we're looking to experiment a lot more in in that side of, of things so not ruling it out but um it's not something in the pipeline right now um also people mentioned macabre at car strength uh over over the christmas period we released a macabre at car strength um and i believe there's some still available there is still retailers within the uk i know that have got some and it, for me, it shows everything which is brilliant about Macabre when you drink it at car strength. Um, whenever we do any of our core range at car strength, there's always a great calling for us to always do it. But unfortunately, as we only produce a relatively small amount of whiskey, um, we we do have to be slightly careful what we do. But the Macabre car strength is is always extremely popular. Right. Well, we're the 20 minutes in and only one whiskey in, so. We better there move you on. You're, you're droning on a bit, George. So we'll, okay. um, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah, you, you stuff your face with the chocolate. You, you enjoy that. You're good at that. Mm. Um, so we'll move on to number two whiskey. I know there's a bunch of questions. We'll, we'll do our best to to get to them whilst getting through the whiskey. So number two, the second whiskey to drink. I don't know if you've got the uh, bottles with you, but I've got the small bottles. Uh, is San Egg. And, uh, very good. Uh, so this is uh, our second part of our core range. So this tasting is split into two parts, really. Core range tasting of Maccabee and San Egan and limited editions of Lot Gorman and the Comrade coming up. So George mentioned a bit on our production size. I mean, we, we, we don't produce a, a huge amount. Uh, we're upping production at the moment as we produce a little bit more year on year. 
But if you want comparisons on Isla, even, you know, the biggest distillery on Isla, Kalila, produced what we do in a year in a matter of, you know, a couple of weeks. So it's a big size difference that we've got. So that's the reason for us really only having two whiskies that are always available throughout the year. Everything else we produce is, is limited in the number of bottles we can release simply because we, we don't have enough casts in the warehouse to release. So it's just Macabre and Sanig that you'll find always available. And these two whiskies are, are great to try like this side by side because you've got the same barley used, the same peating level at, at 50 ppm. It's the same uh, distillation, as someone mentioned earlier, the cut points. It's the same fermentation, same yeast used, same bottling strength, 46%. So the only difference between these two whiskies is the casts and uh, and barrels that's been matured in. So you've got 90% bourbon uh, barrels uh, for Mackey Bay and 10% Oloroso Sherry Hogsheads uh, in that uh, batting. In the San Egg, you've almost got the opposite. You've got now 70% Oloroso Sherry and 30% bourbon. So it's kind of a complete reverse. You'll notice straight away from the colour much darker. I think someone made the comment about do we non-chill filter or natural colour? And and yes, we are completely natural in the way we re release our whiskey. So there's no colouring in here, like you know, traditionally, well, not traditionally, but going back in the whiskey industry, the, the bigger distilleries tend to want their 10-year-old, 12-year-old, 15-year-old to always be that same dark, rich colour. So a bit of caramel colouring is added. Uh ours is natural, so all you see in this in the Maccabay and San Egg and all our whiskies is what the cask has done. And Bourbon barrels tend to give a lighter colour influence to the whisky. And the sherry, as you can see here, gives that darker, richer colour to the whisky. Not only on the colour, but also the character. So as soon as you taste this whisky here. A, a completely different, you know, animal to the Mackey Bay, really. You've got that sort of DNA throughout because it is the same spirit. So you've got some of that fresh fruit, some of that citrus notes. You've got that smoke. But it's now got so much more of the, the richness, a bit of dried fruit to it, more of a dark chocolate, whereas the Maccabay you were getting, uh, if anything, that sort of vanilla side to it. Now it's a more of a, a dark chocolate, a little bit of spiciness on the palate as well, which is all typical of Oloroso sherry flavours, really. And, and the smoke as well, whereas in the Maccabay was more of a salty sort of maritime smoke. This is now that sort of, uh, I was a rich little barbecue smoke almost coming through on the palate. So it's, it's a, although similar DNA through the whiskey, you can see how big an influence the cask is on any whiskey, because this is just, as I said, four or five-year-old whiskey, not a 25-year-old a whiskey, where it's had loads of time to take on the cask influence. It's a relatively short period of time, but you can see how in, important the cask can be, and that's a big thing that our dad uh, tries to portray is, it's okay making the best spirit in the world, but you better put it in the best cask in the world as well, because every single stage matters, particularly the cask influence, and and this shows it, you know, better than most with all so much of production being the same apart from that, that cask influence. No, it's got that real weight in the palate as well. Real, if you can, if you've still got a little bit of the Maccabay left and you, you can compare them, you really do get a, a little bit more sort of weight on the palate, the sort of oily, sort of viscous quality of the liquid going down. It's, it's, it's a lot more going on in there. Um, it's, it's interesting what it does the the peat as well on your palate. You get a little bit more sort of. Um, for me, the peat comes through more on the Macabre, whereas on the on the Sané with those sherry casks, as you can see from the the colour in there, they really come in quite quite strong and they sort of soften the edges of the peat. Um, again, a bottle at forty six percent. So yeah. it's um, and, and people might have seen that there was a has been some slightly darker versions of, of Sané which have. I've been out that was purely down to some overactive casts that we've had um and uh, it just purely shows that as peter mentioned that everything that we do is, is natural color and and non-chill filtered um but but the sane compared to the macabre it just highlights the importance that the cast play um yeah. our dad was sat here he would say cask is king probably something similar to that um yeah i think i think um these two whiskies really, really highlight the, the cask influence as well. And, uh, one thing is also to mention how we fill our cask. You know, it's not fourth fill, fifth fill. So each distillery can choose how how many times they fill their, their cask, really. You know, some distilleries will get a bourbon barrel in. We get all ours from Buffalo Trace in America. Ship all our bar bourbon barrels across, fill them up once, 
use them and, and release a whiskey from them, and then we'll fill them up again as a second fill. But we don't use them third, fourth, fifth, sixth fill like some distilleries may do. Same with our sherry cast. We tend to only use them two or three times. The reason for that is you can get this sort of young, fresh, really full of character whiskey, and it doesn't need to be a, a 20-year-old, 30-year-old dram to take on that influence from the cast. There's no right or wrong. You know, that's the great thing with whiskey. The reason why there's 130 distilleries in Scotland all producing many different styles and, re and different releases themselves is because there's so many different ways to produce whiskey. There's no right or wrong. And, and we're not saying that you need to produce with fresh casts or you need to have small stills. It's just the style that we chose and, uh, to produce is something fairly unique. And again, by using our cast only twice, you get it at this sort of five years of age, but it's got so much character to it. <clears throat> Uh, that it doesn't necessarily need 15, 8, 20 years. But then a 20-year-old whiskey will be very different. It'll be a bit more subtle, a bit more refined. But if you want something with a bit of punch, a bit of sort of freshness, full of character, then then we thought this was the best way to go. And I think you'll find that, hopefully, anyway, in the, in the Maccabee and Stanley. Um, there was You mentioned there 15 and 20-year-old cast. Um, the question that came in was at plans to release... Um, 15 or a 20 year old when we when we get to it i, I briefly touched on it before um but it, it's it purely down to stock levels and and what we have available in our warehouse um in 2005 when we started distilling i believe it was only five or six casts at the top of my head that we actually filled and also yeah, unfortunately slightly wrong there george i think it was 10. that was it 10 well i wasn't I hate correcting you obviously it's a shame oh, well, to have to correct you but <laughs> but um okay the 10 cars um you know some of those were also sold to private individuals like we did in in the early years to raise some money um we managed to buy some of those cars back now but the bulk of our stock really sits from 2009 onwards uh so if we were to do slightly older age statements it will be a few years down the line we do do single casks though there are various single casks out there from 2006 2007 or 2008 that are uh, are available um, in different markets around the world, um, but we just don't have a, a huge amount of them to be able to do a, a continual release at the moment. Um, no, I think there was a question on casts. Sticking with that, the French French casts. Do we have any French wine casts? We we actually tend to do a red wine cast. We've done from Dura Valley in, in Portugal. We've we have done a Saturn uh, wine cask uh, finish though, and actually a full maturation. So there will be more of them, but we haven't dabble too much with with the french wines and, and different varieties it's something we hope to do now that we produce more we hope to be able to experiment a bit more whereas in the past with a such small production we wanted to stick to the casts that we know will work well and and the small amount of experimentation with the casts like, like french wine or portuguese wine or, or numbers so we will do more experimentation but but not too many at the uh, at the moment unfortunately um one quick question also pete about um Maccabe and sanig um will they always remain at the four or five years mark or as the distillery gets older and stocks increase will they increase in age as well yeah i think uh the plan is is they will increase actually the first couple of years when we first released Maccabee, i think mm. was it 2012 or something the idea was that every year we'd put all the cars into the vatting but fortunately i guess for us we, we sold uh quite a lot and Cologne managed to be quite popular uh so we actually sold too much of our early stock so we couldn't then increase the year um sorry the age every year that we planned to so that's why George mentioned it stuck at maybe four or five years for the last three or four years but yeah. now we've managed to build up a bit of our stock every year from now the age will get slightly older and, and that's the reason why the color the character will change slightly over the years of Mackie Bay I saw someone comment about the first time they tried Mackie Bay and it being a bit light and really sort of fruit fruity and now having much more smoke to it and, and that's true Maccabe will uh, evolve over the years so we do I think it's 60 cast fatting so each time we release a, a batch of Maccabe or Sanic it's 60 casts that go in and that may last two months it may last five six months but when we've sold out of that we do a new batch always the same percentage of sherry and bourbon's influence it always remain the same style but it's just it will always be subtly different um, also a question there about the uh, STR. Our dad mentioned recently online that it might be coming into the core range. We have bought, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, number of casks, STR casks that we bought. We have got a lot of casks now that we've filled. Um, so I believe that is a plan to do at some point. Uh, but like everything in, in whiskey making, it, 
it takes a bit of time from the initial idea to when the bottlings get to market. So also dealing with our dad, you know, he changes his mind most days. So he might have bought those casts tomorrow. <laughs> he might change his mind in a couple mm. of weeks and decide that no, I don't want to do that. But he doesn't tell us. Right. So we can we can tell you something something that definitely SDR is coming, but who knows what he'll decide in a couple of weeks. Um yeah, that's a fair point, that Pete. Um <laughs> so yeah, the joys of family businesses. Um he's probably not even watching, is he? No, probably not. <laughs> No, well, he's back on Ireland at the moment. George and I are um, on the mainland, Scotland, at the moment, um, whereas uh, my dad's back on Isla. So uh, he's not going to walk through the door behind us uh, at, at any moment. But I'm sure he's listening intently. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, if he knew how to use Facebook or Instagram, he'd probably comment, but he, he, he doesn't know how to use it. Um, also, another quick question about cast types. We have filled a, um, a large variety of casts recently, um, Calvados, um, tequila, mezcal. Uh, so it is something that now our father's taken a bit more of a, a step back as far as the sales and marketing. He's really now concentrating on on the maturation side of the of the business, uh, and that's something he really does enjoy getting in the warehouse and and trying cars, putting together battings. Um, it, that's really what he loves doing now, um, and it sort of keeps him slightly off our backs as well um, when he's in there um, and. Another quick question before we move on to the next round, which was about uh, the old casks. Um, the old casks that we are, we've are we used, we do sell them on to uh, other distilleries, um, new distilleries that are starting up. Uh, so they are used. So And also we sell them to other producers, whether it's some gone over to, to rum producers. Uh, so they are, they are sold on. Um, and also we, actually uh, when we're done with the, the couple of fillings, um, of our own cars, you can you can buy them if you want. We sell them as, you know, was it garden chairs or uh, plant pots? You know, we don't use them too much anymore, so we sold them on to any anyone and everyone. And also, I have just been reminded, George, we have a San Egg chocolate oh, as well, yes. uh, which is uh, haggis spice dark chocolate. So this is slightly different from the sea salt, so lime and sea salt that paired really well with Macchi Bay. The haggis spice dark chocolate, as you can imagine. That haggis is a, it's a rich, I want to say meaty flavour, but it doesn't do the chocolate justice if I probably say meaty flavour, but it's got that <laughs> richness, more weight to it. And obviously the dark spiciness, great with the Oloroso, Oloroso sherry, which is typically darker fruit, a little bit of pepper, spiciness on the back of the palate. So again, if you've got the chocolate at home, try the whiskey first, then the chocolate with the whiskey. And another great combination, of course, uh, a bit of Scottish in there as well with it, with the haggis. So you uh, you can't go wrong. Um, now, right. over to you, now over to me thank you very much whiskey number three uh so um whiskey number three this is a a pre-release sample so this is a whiskey that isn't actually available yet um this is our, our loch gorm uh which is an annual release uh that we've been releasing since and i've forgotten now how when we started loch gorm 2014 I, it's lucky i'm here to correct you all the time yeah correct me 2014. I don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't know either. Somewhere around then. I think it was 2012, actually. Well, somewhere. Yeah. And we started releasing Loch Gorm. Um, and Loch Gorm is fully matured in Oros and Sherry Butts. So over the years, um, it, it's changed as far as the age profile of the casks and also the combination of fresh and refilled casks. And dealing with Oloroso Sherry Butts, big cast weigh half a ton when they're full you've got a lot of strong flavors in the in the wood itself but also coming from our heavily peated spirit you've you've got that real combination of flavors that you have to marry well together so maturing in oloroso sherry is is something that we enjoy doing we're doing more of it now uh, in the early days we probably filled 70 percent into bourbon uh, 20% into sherry and then 10% into experimental casks as far as wine casks or pork casks. But now we've increased the amount of sherry casks we, we fill, mainly also because of the, the San Egg. But the Loch Gorm, and, and this year's Loch Gorm is a combination of uh, 24 casks, uh, 24 casks that we filled um, from 2011 and 2012. Um, and we've got in there in those 24 casts four of them are refill casts the majority are 
fresh casks um, from 2011 and 2012. So with those fresh casks, you really are getting a, a bigger influence from the sherry coming forward. Um, previous releases of Loch Gorm, especially uh, last year's release, had slightly more refill casks in there. So similar age, but more refill casks, which allowed the Kilhoman characters to maybe come through slightly stronger and the sherry influence to be slightly less. Whereas this year's one, for me personally, you really do get that that big sherry influence coming forward. Very, very little peat smoke on the nose for me. Just get those big, almost buttery cooked, cooked fruits, fresh fruits, bit of spice coming forward. Um, and it's got a huge amount of sort of, for me, it's, it's sort of, <laughs> you right there? We're not interrupting yeah. you, George. No, sorry. <laughs> I sort of lost my... Uh... And then again on the palate, it's you do get a little bit of spice, a little bit of that nuttiness coming forward. There's a huge depth of flavour to it. Um, and that is down to the, the added ageing, but also the quality of these casts that we get from Miguel Martin um, in Seville. We're, we're very fortunate that when we started... In 2005, we were able to, to source cars from uh, from Buffalo Trace for our bourbon cars, and then all our sherry cars from Miguel Martin. And the quality of these cars are fantastic, and it really is showing now. Um, and the balance of the flavors for me is, is there. Sometimes the peat and the sherry fight, but this is where we have to put a little bit of credit to maybe Robin Bignall, our production manager, and maybe our father, um, for vatting these casts together, those 24 casts, what you're looking for is you're not always looking for your best sherry casts in the warehouse of a certain age. You're looking for the ones that will marry well together. Um, and that's when the combination of fresh and refills really, really comes out. And the development of this whiskey is, is fantastic for me. Um, and we, we plan to release this at the end of March. So not too long to wait. Yeah. And I guess... You might be curious, actually, probably looking at the Lot Gorm and the Sane, wondering why Lot Gorm fully matured and sherry is dark, is lighter than the Sane, which is only 70% sherry. But um, that's with the cast. And here, George mentioned, I think it was 24, was it, in this in this van? Yeah. Where they're all sherry butts, a big 500 litre cast compared to the Sane, which is mainly using those uh, hogsheads, which are only 250 litres. So much smaller cast, very active. They give more influence into the whiskey quicker. So actually more of that standing influence coming in there. But this is where it's interesting. Again, it's not all about just type of cask or type of spirit or is it first fill, second fill, third fill cask. There's so many different factors to whiskey, in, including the size of the barrel. So with these being big 500 litre sherry butts, the lot of gore, it's a bit slower in maturation, but it's hopefully more integrated. George mentioned the depth of flavour that's coming in where you taste this whiskey, but it's got real weight goes well on into the finish you're tasting those flavors and and that's due to the the sort of bigger cask i guess slower but more integrated maturation because this is that nine years remember so you know reasonably old for a, a kill home and release really so it's got that extra bit of weight to it and um so yeah we could probably talk for hours on all the different factors of what's made this a different dram but it's, it's always been a popular one like Paul. yeah it's always hugely popular and also you with the size of the cast you the, the sort of the aging process takes longer and and it, what I find most interesting when we it comes to the next release of the Loch Gorm is, is the combination of fresh and refill casks. Um, the age at the moment will not probably go a huge amount above the nine, 10 year old bracket. And it's now just about marrying the cask well together. Um, you know, it's, it's for me, it's slightly lost that. It's like younger Loch Gorms had that big barbecue smoke, almost meaty flavor to it. Whereas now we move moved away from the meaty aromas more into the sort of cloves and nuts and things like that coming forward from it. So there's slightly more development in there. Right, George, I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions from the, the far away. Uh, Zaj Kaj is asking, which of the core range is typical sort of Kilhoman taste? Um, see, what I would say is probably something similar to the, the Machiavé as far as that it gives you a good idea of what Kilhoman's DNA is um, where, as you get the full flavour of our, our spirit coming forward and our distillery characteristics. Lovely. Well done. Quite quick. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we've got another one here from Travis who I think I'll be doing a 
a tasting uh, with soon, so I look forward to that. Uh, but will there be a car strength version of the Stanig or Loch Gorm? Um, I doubt there'll be a combination of the Loch Gorm, but the Stanig one is not isn't something that we'd rule out. Um, it would be interesting to try a Stanig at, at car strength, um, but again, it, it's down to stock profile in the warehouse. Very good, very good. Uh, you want uh, me to elaborate a bit more, or? No, 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 no. Short and sharp is, is good. Um, how do we judge our best sherry casts? Is it depending on the sh uh, depending by the sherry that was in there? So we're very lucky that the, the quality of the casts that come from Miguel Martin, when they arrive at the distillery, before we fill any of these casks, um, the guys in the still house or anyone that's filling the cask will knows the cask before they fill it and they are looking for the rich, rounded sherry influence coming forward. Um, and then we'll fill them. And then it's always very interesting to then monitor them as they are maturing. Uh, because I think it's, uh, when Peter and James and I did a tasting, I think it was a couple of years ago at the festival, we did a warehouse lock-in uh, lock and we selected some casks and we went and selected some old sherry casks. And we just went for an old one and went to the easiest one to get. And we thought, well, this is a 2007 Oloroso sherry cask first fill, it would be brilliant. And actually it was interesting the fact that even though it had been in that sherry cask for that long, the sherry influence hadn't really taken over as much as the cask next to it. So these sherry casks always take a lot more monitoring and, and vary hugely compared to the bourbon casks. Uh, you were doing well with the short answers, but you um, <laughs> you tripped up there, unfortunately. Everyone everyone got bored by that. Yeah, yeah. well, you can bore um, them a bit more now. <laughs> no, it was just one mentioning on the on the tour for the European tour. Oh no, here we go. Uh, do we produce unpeated unpeated spirit occasionally? Uh, yes, is the answer to that, but but not not actually on purpose. Uh, most of the time, we uh, we produce all peated spirit is the idea. Sometimes twenty ppm, which is relatively light. Sometimes fifty ppm, which is a bit heavier. And that's really what we've stuck to. But occasionally uh, at Kilhome and things don't go to plan. And uh, we uh, produced unpeated spirit. I think when originally when our conveyor blocked when we were clearing the malt floor, uh, and we didn't get enough mold up there, so one week happened to be unpeated, and then that went into one bin. And a couple of weeks later, later we'd do another one, and that when we be blocked. So uh, we'd do a couple of couple of weeks virtually unpeated, and, and that's how it came about. I think we've only ever released maybe only a handful, maybe five or six single casts yeah, of unpeated indeed. batches. Uh, two in the UK last year. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a a small part of what we do, but um, we we hope to do something like that more in the future. And that's again down to our production size. We are now producing a bit more whiskey, so hopefully in the future we now can have a bit more experimenting. Whether it's with different casts, different strengths, different peating levels, all are a bit more capable now. When we when we were only producing a small amount, we, we didn't have really any any flexibility. Um, there you go, George. That's one for you. Uh, can you tell us if your wart is clear or cloudy? <coughs> I just choked on a bit of chocolate. You've eaten chocolate. You can give it, put it down for a little bit. Well, I thought you were on a bit of a roll. So, um, our wart is um, is clear. Um, so I, I can't really elaborate much more. More, more on that. To expand so much, yeah. The wort, obviously, that that we drain all the sugar from the the barley that we we grow on at home. We, we drain all the sugar from there, goes through into the washbacks. We add the yeast, and then that's when we're creating alcohol effectively. Um, so all these different parts of the process, whether it's clear or cloudy, what type of yeast you use, all these parts of the process make a difference on on the tastes and flavors you're bringing through here. And, and just to mention on the the wort that comes through, and when we add the yeast. The fermentation time we do for almost four days of fermentation which is a huge amount of time compared to most in the industry we tend to go only you know a couple of days of fermentation and that's it but the idea with the long fermentation is to build up the esters the lactic acid in the, the, the washbacks there so when we distill that it's a real fruity flavor that comes through on the whiskies and hopefully tonight whether it's been bourbon barrel sherry barrel nine years old or five years old that fruit has really come through one quick question before you go on to the last round, Peter. COVID, has it had much impact on the business? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's been 
Oh, oh, bizarre, yeah, I'm sure for everyone. I mean, for whiskey, you know, uh, George is, is UK manager, so he does a lot of the UK traveling and around the UK, which has, has stopped. But for me and, and James, my other brother, who look after the international markets, we're usually on planes all around the world at the moment, traveling and promoting Kilhoman. And, and it has been a huge difference because for a small band like us, you know, we're not putting up billboards and doing spending huge amounts on online promotion. It's it's really about word of mouth and and that's where these online tastings have come in. So it's it's had an impact on us hugely by changing the way we work. You know, usually we're out in the market giving tastings, giving people drams because that's the way we've done it for the last 15 years. Now it's it's things like this really online tastings, doing our best to get home in, in, in as many hands as possible without actually traveling around the world so that's been the big impact also i guess with with us having all our production on the same site is made things a bit easier during lockdown you know we've got our own bottling hall where we bought our own products we've not had to ship whiskey around and rely on other bottlers and things like that so it's really been a benefit to us to have everything on site so um a lot of changes yes um but hopefully it's been been managed all right i think yeah the online tastings um i can't remember exactly how many we've done but We've we've done a lot of them now, and it's and they have been they have been great for us, and it and it also shows the importance of uh, um, of having our own bottling hall. Uh, so that has been huge, and being able to get these packs out to people and engage in a slightly different way. Yeah, and I can't wait to get out and around the world. Usually, a, a you know endless flights through the year, uh, probably not for off sort of 50, 60 flights. So uh, I can't wait. There's people here from America, and, uh, Germany. Uh, France and all over, and I, I, I'm looking forward to to getting back out there and, and having a few drams with you. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm longing for that rather than being stuck at the moment, which is in my uh, in my house, uh, not doing an awful lot at the moment. But um, except for working, we'll hard. It's working hard, you're doing a lot. You're working. You're not just <laughs> yeah. Of course, sorry. This is a busy work night. You know, this is overtime. Yeah. It's now overtime. It's almost quarter to eight. You know, this is overtime really on on the work. Um, but we'll, we'll we'll get on to. Um, the last round now, the Combrake Batch 4, which uh, you might see there, um, which some of you may not have heard of, really. It may be a new dram to a lot of you. It isn't something that is available all throughout the world, all through the year. You can buy any way you want. It, it's an unusual Kilhoman where we, we've actually paired up with various whiskey bars all around the world from China, Australia, America, uh, and, and also all throughout Europe. Uh, and it's uh, a release that's not available to buy. You can't buy this retail from us. You can't buy this retail anywhere in the world. I mean, if they have, it's been a bottle that's snuck through somewhere, which uh, mm. which we didn't want. Uh, but the idea behind the Comrade batch is we're now into batch four, which is being released in a couple of weeks' time. All the batches are available only in these bars. So we've teamed up with around about 100 bars, I think it is, around the world. And only these venues can you have a dram or, or, of this release. And... We wanted to pair up not just with massive whiskey bars who, who have all sorts of whiskeys. We wanted really passionate people who are not only interested in Kilhoman, but passionate about uh, promoting whiskey in general, um, educating people on on what they're drinking and and, um, and, and whiskey as a whole. Comrade is a, is a word, uh, a Gaelic word that, that means sanctuary. Uh, and if you're going on the historical reference to this, uh, you know, I think it's back in the 800s almost, uh, there was a Kilhoman church, which is up beside the distillery. Uh, and there's three sanctuary stones uh, around the church. One that is existing today, and you can go and see if you come visit Kilhoman, uh, which is is sort of marking out uh, an area of Comrade, an area of sanctuary, where you are safe from harm, harassment, arrest, uh, and protected by the church. Uh, and that's the idea we wanted to bring to the whiskey, whereas whatever's going on in life, whether it's COVID or well, actually you can't go to bars in COVID, that's not a no, terrible example. Saying. But whether it's stress at work, it's who knows what, marriage, kids, whatever it might be. <laughs> I'm getting into a whole different subject now. Uh, but the idea well, is that the sanctuary well. away from all this. You can go and have a dram, enjoy some whiskey uh, and uh, and relax. And that's the idea with this one where on our website is a, is a map of all the comrakes around the world. As I said, I think there's about 100, 120 or so comrakes where this release will be available and hopefully a whole host of other Kilhomans as well for you to enjoy. But, but onto the actual whiskey, it's, it's cast strength. So the other three whiskeys were 46% ABV. This one's a jump up at 55% alcohol. It's three fresh bourbon barrels. So 
the other three again were either sherry or some part of sherry influence. This is all bourbon barrel, all fresh bourbon. So it's only uh, had Kilhoma in it at one time is, is the reason behind the fresh name. And on the nose, I think where it's different from the others is that little bit of sherry influence gives you that slight richness, a slight darker fruit and masks maybe a bit of that fresh fruit. So here you've got a load of that citrus, fresh fruit, or an orange peel, uh, lemon, the vanilla sort of buttery sweetness from the ex bourbon barrels. But some of the strength, the 55% is reasonably strong. Some of the strength can hold back a little bit of the nose. But on the palate is where you get the benefit from, from the real car strength whiskey. You know, on the palate here, you'll bring it in and it will explode with character, flavour. It's a huge, long finish to this whiskey. I think that's where car strength in particular you benefit. It's not just, you know, you get a bit more flavour at the front or anything like that. It's that long finish where not just 30 seconds, probably 30 minutes afterwards, you're still tasting that smoke, that light sweetness comes in and it comes in in waves. And that's not necessarily all cast strength whiskies, though. I think what we're most proud of is this is, you know, nine, almost 10 year old whiskey, but it's it's not burning your throat with strength. It's not it's not harsh or aggressive. It is strong. Yes, don't get me wrong, but it's hopefully strong with character and flavor. And, and um, you know, feel free to add water to this. Yeah. You know, whiskey's not afraid of water. It works with water. We reduce some of our whiskey before we bottle it anyway. This is natural, though, at car strength. So feel free to try it first without water. And it, it actually isn't too harsh, in my opinion. It can take it straight. But everyone likes their whiskey differently. So feel free to add, add a few drops of water. It will change and, and evolve and, and adapt. It really does have that tropical fruit characteristic. A few people um, have been mentioning on there that they may have had the slightly wrong dram in their in their pack. And some people have got 100% Isla in their pack. Um, we apologize for this. This is... Purely is this down why to, you were laughing when I was talking there? Yeah, I just, uh, well, and also a friend, is, a friend is writing some interesting bits in there. Um, oh. But I made me giggle. Um, but uh, yeah, apologies for anyone who got the 100% Isla. Actually, what, you, what you've what you got there with the 100% Isla is uh, the whiskey that's made from the, the barley grown on the farm there. Um, so what you've, what you've got in your pack is actually... Um, Hunter Isla there, which is uh, made with the barley that we've grown on the farm, um, and that has been matured in the combination of, of bourbon and sherry cask for a similar amount of time, actually. Um, so uh, we we apologise um, for the uh, the slight mistake that was made um, in in getting the the wrong dram in your pack. Um, but but back to the comrade, it, it really it, pairing up with these bars is also a great way to. Um, to, to sh give them releases that are either slightly different or slightly older. We've done um, not just old expressions, we've done experimental casks, um, et cetera. So, and for me, when you go into the, the car strength, the, the bourbon, fresh bourbons, straight from Buffalo Trace, really do um, show the, the quality of the wood and also the spirit as well. Yeah, I think that's key. It's it's showing off Kilhoman in its best, which is why we fill so many bourbon barrels, you know, and it's tempting to fill sherry casts, red wine casts, so term, which give a powerful influence on the whiskey. But sometimes, you know, with a full sherry maturation, sometimes you're tasting the whiskey and it's just ex sherry cask and you can barely tell what whiskey distillery it comes from or what country it comes from, let alone what distillery. Whereas it's always about finding that balance between whiskey, spirit, that you produce and the cask influence you don't want ever really we don't want to taste the kilhoman you know that's just the cask influence and you can't tell the the flavor that comes through the spirit through the fermentation through the stills through the barley we've grown on the farm and all that side of things so it's really important to get that balance and the bourbon cast really allow you to do that a little bit more where it's that butter, butterscotch sweetness the vanilla it comes through but but really it's showing off the distillery in a great style and i think someone was commenting there about how it's one of the smoothest car shrink whiskies they've ever had and, and and that's what we're so proud of i think you know we can release these 55 60 percent alcohol whiskies and it doesn't blow you away it's not really harsh it's just all that flavor that you get coming through which um which is great and also they're old when we we talk about age as far as they're old for us but this is still a relatively young whiskey if you put that out there compared to to other distilleries and what they're they're producing um and it's it is great to be able to do and and 
you will also, this is what we do with the single casts that, that are made available to various different markets. Um, you are getting kill home at, at its at its very best. One question that did pop up, which I was meant to answer before, which is about the expansion of the, the new still house. Um, it is a identical replica still house. So in, in theory, we can produce over 400,000 litres of alcohol when it's running at full capacity. At the moment, we are in the region of just over 300,000 litres. Um, of course, with, with COVID, we were shut down for a while um, at the back end of last year, but hopefully this year we'll have a, a better run of it. And um, we will look to produce it in the region of 350,000 litres. Um, and for us, that's a huge step up and there's a lot more whiskey to, to warehouse. So it's meant that we've been building new warehouses at the distillery. Anyone who's visited Kilhoman over the years would have seen it evolve um, over time. And it's gone from a building site to stopping looking like a building site for a small period of time. And now we are building new warehouses at the moment. We just finished a new visitor center. The timing couldn't have been worse with the new visitor center. We opened it um, a year ago next weekend i think 21st of of february was when we opened that and sadly we've only been able to welcome a few visitors there um at the back end of the summer um but also the new still house uh, new warehousing um and we're now building some new offices so it's it's a lot going on at the distillery but it's all very exciting um and it, and it and it's great to be able to see the the distillery evolve like that and we can't wait to be able to welcome people back. Um, of course, this year we the Feshiel won't be won't be happening, um, but we will be doing something online. So we will announce what we're going to do. Um, tastings. Yeah. Unfortunately, you'll be seeing more of us online. That's yeah, <laughs> basically a bit more of this. Yeah. <laughs> we'll try and keep George off the camera next time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, any any last questions? We've only got a couple of minutes. I think you know at most. So. Um, I think there was a question on where are we? Any what other cast types have we have we experimented with? Sorry, sorry, I was actually reading another question. To listen to the the questions, George. That's the idea. Pardon? I'll answer it then. So the question, the cast we've got. We I mean, it's a whole host really from uh, Madeira, Saturn, red wine. Um, what else have we done? We've done rum casts. Uh, well, we've also got some tequila mezcal maturing. Um, what else is there? Uh, STR casts that we've done. Um, have I missed port any other? Port casts, of course, that we've done. So all these experimental casts, but unfortunately, again, with the amount we produce, these experimental casts are are, are very small in, in the amount we can actually release of them. So I think at most, sometimes only five or 6,000 bottles that are going you know, worldwide to 50 countries or so. So it, it, it's difficult to, to manage sometimes, but if you ever do see these different casts of Kilhoman, they're usually really small batches that we've done and um as i've been in the been a bit of experiment yeah um and and as i said before that's something that our father is is very keen to to be able to do um and he he enjoys that side of it so you will see in the few next few years more um more experimental casts coming up and someone asked about the tequila um that's actually coming on very nicely um and there are a few casts being made available um, out there, we've got tequila and we've also got mezcal. So the mezcal's got a slightly more smokiness to it. So you will be seeing some of those released um, in the in 2021 um, around the world. But again, a limited amount that will be available. Um, but it, it's sort of the way we do it because we're not distilling a huge amount. Well, we are a bit more now. We have to be the bulk of what we do goes into the likes of the Maccabay and the Sané, Loch Gorms, etc., the bourbons and the sherries. And these experimental casks are important to us, but we, we also concentrate a lot on core expressions. All right, I think we've got about 20 seconds left or so, 30 seconds. So um, we'll, we'll try our best to answer some of the questions that have come in uh, over the, the last little period there and, and get back to you. But but thanks for, for listening and um, hopefully you've learned a little bit over there. The last hour or so and um and enjoyed a few of the drams whether it's been the ones in the tasting pack or anything else you had in your your cupboard but um feel free to get in touch whether it's through the link here or contact us on our website for for any information and, and we'll get back to you soon but Sanjava, cheers and enjoy the the rest of your evening um and uh yeah we'll see you again soon yeah thank you very much